right? My name is Frank Ferretti, the author of Democracy Under Siege, Don't Let Them Lock It Down. I read this book because in, in recent times, I've become very concerned about the hostility that's often communicated towards democracy. Time and time again, I hear stories about how democracy doesn't lead to the right results. We hear scare stories about people voting the wrong way because populist politicians get elected. A lot of people here in Britain became very critical of democracy when the Brexit referendum led to the defeat of the people who were against it. And it seems to me that it's become very important in a moment when populism uh, is pathologized and is often cast into the role of a villain to begin to explore and examine what democracy is all about. And in recent years, what I've done is I've gone around different parts of Europe to give lectures and talks about the importance of populism, about the importance of democracy. A couple of years ago, I had a really important experience which led me to think about writing this book. I was in Amsterdam in the De Bali Center talking about populism and trying to explain why uh, despite appearances of being a, a professor of sociology and an academic, I was wholeheartedly in favor of Brexit. And I talked about populism, I talked about democracy and the democratic way of life. And when I finished, a very interesting thing happened. A guy put up his hand and said, Professor Ferredi, are you really arguing that democracy is something that's good in and of itself? In other words, he was asking me the question, do you think that democracy is good regardless of what its outcome is? And I was taken aback about it because I'm a 120% committed person as far as democracy is concerned. And I said, look, I think democracy is a value in and of itself, even if the wrong people get elected, even if people I disagree with get elected, that in no way calls into question my commitment to the ideal of democracy. And I could hear the audience hissing or the audience feeling a little bit uncomfortable because as far as they were concerned, democracy wasn't something that was inherently valuable. Democracy was just a, a very efficient way of gaining people's consent and getting people elected. So I began to think about why, why is this? And then COVID happened. And I began to realize that now more than ever before, it was really important to discuss democracy, to promote its virtues, because in the middle of the pandemic, a lot of people were arguing that democracy is perhaps something we can put on ice until the pandemic is over. You know, we don't really want to listen to what ordinary people have got to say about the pandemic or about how they should organize their life. It was important that we listen to the experts, the scientists who knew what was, best, what was in our best interests. And indeed, a lot of people began to suggest that uh, in those places in the world where democracy was conspicuous by its absence, for example, in China, they were dealing much better with the pandemic than in democratic societies. So that's really the background to it. And I began to think about what's really going on in the world, you know, what is, you know, what's really taking place. And I began to realize that in the world we live in, there are far more commentaries far more books, far more newspaper articles published that explain why democracy is a problem, why we don't need democracy or we need far less democracy than we have at the moment than actually to praise its virtues. And if you don't believe me, I suggest you go to any bookshop, big bookshop, look at the nonfiction uh, uh, part of it, and you'll find that there are books written about um, the death of democracy. You have Jason Brennan writing a book called Against Democracy. We have uh, people talking about how the West is committing suicide by being too democratic. I think it's important to realize that this hostility to democracy by many commentators is not something that is new. The panic about democracy has been around right from the very beginning of political life in the West. It's important to realize that uh, it's very rare, in fact, when people 
are genuinely able to enjoy a democratic way of life and when democracy is praised by the political elites. If we go back the last two and a half thousand years, we will find that when democracy emerged in Athens, the people who were against democracy were the ones that were writing about it. In Western political theory, anti-democratic ideas emerged before democratic ideas. And the reason for that was, was because the oligarchy in Athens two and a half thousand years ago was worried about the fact that the people were beginning to demand that their voices was heard. And in Athens, alone in all the, uh, all the, par the only part in the world, you had the emergence of what's called democratia. Democratia means a combination of demos and kratia. De demos means people, kratia means power. In other words, democracy is about people's power. And when the oligarchy began to realize that the people were taking themselves very, very seriously, they began to argue that, in fact, uh, democracy actually meant the rule of the mob. The most important uh, contribution on this subject was written by Plato, the Greek philosopher, who in his book The Republic and in other commentaries basically argued that we must avoid having democracy because it ba would basically mean the tyranny of the majority against the uh, well-being of the chosen few. I think it's interesting to realize that political theory from Plato onwards has tended to repeat the same kind of arguments. The arguments that we hear today about democracy and its limits and its downside were already articulated by Plato. Let me give you an example. In one of his uh, commentaries, Plato has Socrates having a discussion with Protagoras where they discuss the idea of democracy and the role of the people. And Socrates, who is considered to be the most sensitive, sophisticated philosopher, basically says, look, Protagoras, why is it that in a world where we rely on experts, where, for example, we rely upon an engineer to build the machines that we use, where we rely upon skilled builders to build the ships that we sail in, where we rely upon a captain who's an expert navigator to navigate the ship, why is it that in Athens we don't have experts running our political system, but we allow anybody, any Tom, Dick, and Harry can take a role, a public role, and, and participate in public life? Why is it that we don't rely on experts in politics, whereas everywhere else we rely upon uh, sort of ex uh, experts all the time. And Socrates poses this question basically to argue that the demos, the people, have got no role to play in political life. Their views, as he puts it, are not worth taking seriously. He's very clear on this point. He's very clear on the point that the ordinary people do not have the moral or the intellectual resources to make the right kind of decisions. And you see, what's interesting about what Socrates is saying and said was that pretty much the same arguments have been rehearsed and repeated century after century after century. And even today, we often encounter people saying, well, you know, ordinary people are not very educated. Ordinary people haven't got their own opinions. They haven't got the capacity to deal with complex ideas. We live in a very difficult world, uh, an internet world where everything is, is highly sophisticated. How can you rely on uneducated people to make the right kind of decision? This was an argument that was used at the time of the Brexit referendum. How could you rely on ordinary British voters to know what's in their best interest when the European Union is such a complex, sophisticated institution? And then we're told, and this is already said by, by Socrates, we're told that people are easily confused by what they read. They're very easily manipulated by the sophists, by people who are able to manipulate their ideas. And you know, these days we talk about how the media more or less controls how people vote. And people often make the point that when people vote in the elections, they don't vote in accordance with their interests. They vote in accordance about what they've been told by the media. And we're told that people are so foolish that they get completely manipulated and corrupted by advertising.
So the argument that's used time and time again, basically, is that ordinary people lack the moral and the intellectual resources to be able to handle sophisticated arguments, to be reliable in the public domain. Now, this argument has been around for over two and a half thousand years, and there's only been very, very rare instances when it's been challenged. Athens, 5th, BC, 5th century BC, was one of them. And I always tell my friends to read Pericles' funeral oration, where for the first time we have a speech made a very, very long time ago, where he basically says, in Athens, unlike anywhere else, we don't judge people by whether they're rich or not, whether they're from a noble caste or an ordinary caste. We don't particularly care how much money we have. All that we care is about their character. He's basically saying that anybody in Athens can participate in political life if they want to. And to some extent, that was true. Obviously, there were limits in Athens because in those days, you had to be a man. You had to be over a certain age. Uh, and yet to own property to participate. But the very fact was that in Athens, they discovered what I think is the most important gift of democracy is the idea of political equality. As long as we have political equality, as long as all of us are equal before the law, then despite the fact that some of us are more advantaged than others, we still have the potential to influence our future. We don't have to defer to fate. Because as political equals, we're able to, at least potentially, determine our future. And at the time, uh, that was very, very rare. And you, you then go on century after century, and you'll find that for the next 1,000 years, next 1,500 years, 2,000 years, there's virtually no evidence that democracy is taken seriously anywhere in the world. In fact, the philosophy Hannah Arendt very well uses the term the miracle of freedom's rare appearance. And when Arendt talks about the miracle of freedom's rare appearance, what she means is that it's very, very rare when people and society take freedom sufficiently seriously to have a proper democracy. The, probably the first modern or near modern example we have is the English Civil War. And I think the English Civil War in the 17th century was an important occasion where the people uh, in England, the levelers in particular, were arguing for the right to be taken seriously. They were arguing that basically we had the capacity to reason just as much as the noblemen. And when you read someone like Thomas Rainsborough, he is basically arguing for the right to consent. He's basically saying that nobody has the right to rule over us. Governments do not have the right to make laws unless we've consented to their role, unless we've consented to their capacity to make these laws for us. And that was really quite important. I mean, John Milton, the poet, is just wonderful in the way he's writing about his trust in the capacity of people to reason and to make choices. I mean, even today, 400 years later, so many philosophers argue against the idea that people can be trusted to reason. It's so nice that already at that point, Milton is raising this as, as his view of the world, as, as, as his orientation to the world. In a sense, after the English Civil War, democracy goes into hibernation. We have a few attempts at creating democracy. We have the French Revolution, uh, in the 18th century, a very important occasion, which for a while is able to take democracy seriously. It says that people, you know, people have the capacity to rule, and we're making a revolution in the name of the people. You have the American Revolution also occurring a little bit before that, which is also beginning to experiment with democracy, although the elites in America, the founding fathers, are a little bit hesitant about uh, allowing democracy to prevail, and therefore they're trying to put limits on it. And of course, we have the 19th century where in America, the populist movement in the 19th century, the Jacksonian populist movement led by Andrew Jackson is demanding that the franchise should be extended so that more and more people should have the right to vote. So we have a, a very you know, kind of a gradual evolution of democracy
and its uh, practice. But the thing that I think is important for you to realize is that while this is going on, there are very few intellectuals, very few philosophers, political theorists, who are wholeheartedly advocating democracy. You know, even such great philosophers as Spinoza or, or Immanuel Kant, who were leading lights in the Enlightenment and very important in their own right, they were a little bit scared of the people. I think the unfortunate thing was that very few philosophers, very few people with great innovative ideas were able to trust ordinary people and their capacity uh, to take responsibility for the welfare of their society. And what you have gradually is a situation where in, from the 19th century onwards, you have uh, democracy expanding mainly because the elites realize that unless they have the consent of the people, it's very difficult to govern a modern society. And they realize that if you're gonna have consent, you need to allow people to vote, at least some, of, some people to vote. So you have the expansion of the franchise, but nevertheless, while uh, they give more people the right to consent and they give more people the right to vote, there are very, limit, very real limits that are being placed on democracy itself. And what we find is that it's not until 1945, after the Second World War, that people become at least rhetorically committed to democracy. The reason why in 1945 everybody becomes a Democrat is because of the negative example of the Nazi experience. People react with horror to the Holocaust. They react with horror to fascism. And they began to realize that at the end of the day, what they need is the opposite to the Nazis and the fascists, and that is democracy. From 1945 onwards, we move into the world where even people who are viscerally hostile to democracy feel obliged to call themselves Democrats. So for example, imagine this, uh, the government in North Korea, which is totally authoritarian and dictatorial, calls North Korea the Democratic Republic of North Korea. Nobody says they're against democracy, at least not outwardly. But nevertheless, what happens is that in practice, there are very real attempts to limit democracy, to insulate, at, at least insulate, the institutions of government from the direct pressure of the people. And from 45 onwards, what we have is what I would call an insulated form of democracy, where democracy becomes increasingly uh, one that is led by experts. So you have a situation in Britain and in France, America, where the experts are given a disproportionate role in determining our future, where the courts, the judiciary, often make political decisions instead of parliament. And what we have alongside of it is a situation where, despite the fact that rhetorically we're all in favor of democracy, democracy itself is very rarely celebrated. You know, one of the things that really uh, makes me sad is that in the 21st century, you find very few attempts to educate young people in the value of genuine citizenship. Very few attempts to celebrate democracy itself as a particular way of life. And I think what we have is a situation where instead of seeing democracy as, a, as the most important value of all that we should love, democracy is often presented as a kind of procedure as a kind of uh, institution through which we elect people. In other words, once we see democracy merely as a system of voting, once we see democracy merely as a way of electing people, a kind of process, then there is very little to love about it. People are not gonna fall in love with a form of election. Why would anybody with any hint of idealism get inspired by the fact that they can go and vote every four or five years. I think as a result of that, democracy is very easily criticized and very easily negated by those people who don't like the outcome of democracy. And what I try to do in my book is very simply to celebrate democracy and basically put forward a proposition that democracy is not a piece of paper. Democracy is not simply a form of electing people. It's not a procedure. Democracy is a way of life. And what I argue in the book, and I think what's important for me, is that for democracy to really mean something, we have to live 
democracy. We have to live democracy. We have to make it come alive. And the way we essentially make it come alive is by gaining our voice, by understanding that me and you and everybody else are politically equal. It doesn't matter what our background is. It doesn't matter what our identity is. It doesn't matter where our parents come from. We are, at the end of the day, politically equal. And because of that, our voices ought to be equal as well. And we should never allow people to suggest that just because I haven't got, or you haven't got a PhD in psychology or nuclear physics, you are less of a political animal than somebody who is a professor or somebody who is very rich and very affluent. As democratic citizens, not only are we politically equal, and not only do we have the potential to change and influence the world around us, we also have a responsibility to do that. And I think that what's important for us to understand is that we cannot leave political decision-making to the experts. We cannot allow a small oligarchy decide what our future should be. We have to take matters into our own hands. We have to take ourselves seriously and begin to work and act as democratic citizens. Thank you. How long was that?